It's Thursday, July 25. Good afternoon. I'm Herman Green with your midday news. A special welcome if you're watching online at onespotmedia.com. We begin with a TVJ News exclusive as health concerns are threatening the closure of one of St. Anne's major markets. This despite promises made by Prime Minister Andrew Holness in 2017 that millions would be spent to upgrade the facility in Ocherius. The Ocherius market, once the pride of a resort town, but for the past few years, the condition of the market has become an R for many residents. This, due to the infrastructural issues and the lack of proper bathroom facilities. Vendors who operate in the market also call for upgrades to the facility. It seemed their calls were being answered, as on Thursday, May 4, 2017, Prime Minister Andrew Holness at a town hall meeting dubbed Hope for Jamaica had said that the Otrius market will be getting a $100 million upgrade through the Urban Development Corporation, UDC. But checks made by TVJ News revealed that no work has begun on the facility and it's still unclear when those works will commence. Despite the lack of the improvements, concerns are growing as the St. Anne Public Health Department has threatened to close down the market. Chief Public Health Inspector for St. Anne, Leroy Scott, explained the reason behind the decision. And so from our observation and from information that has been communicated to us, they have been using the, the grounds and other areas of the market to ease themselves. However, Mayor of St. Anne's Bay, Michael bell Nevis, has denied the reports of the pending closure. You know, the Public Health Department falls under the municipal corporation. They're all in the same um, municipality. Uh, the fact is that um, the, uh, the, the market itself, is, uh, they, they went through and did um, a, a survey of the market and came back um, and made a report at the council meeting. We asked them to survey the market. There was no threat to close the market per se. Mr. Scott says this is not the first time they have made these reports to the St. Anne Municipal Corporation. At one recent inspection that we did, we saw evidence of that. Um, and this is not only the first time because this, this is a matter that we have brought to the municipal cooperation. He says the issue could be even more serious as there is no way to determine the extent of the problem. We do not always see all the, 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 the waste that persons may have deposited. Mayor Bell Nevis says the issue could be eliminated but some vendors have taken up residence in the market. Hours of operation for the market um, does not extend into the nights. So uh, those individuals who are operating within the markets are operating illegally at nights. This leads to security challenges. So the, the, what we're looking to do is to, in, yes, essentially, we're going to have to force people out of the market um, during non-market hours so we don't have a situation where they're you wanting to use the bathrooms. When the bathrooms are closed, when there is, in fact, um, the markets are not in, not in operation. Machine Masters. TVJ News. Justice Minister Delroy Chuck has turned down an invitation to attend a national stakeholders meeting to discuss crime. The meeting was organized by the opposition People's National Party, PNP. We have the details in this report. The People's National Party, PNP, is expected to host a national stakeholder meeting on crime on July 30 at the Jamaica Conference Center. On Monday, opposition leader Dr. Peter Phillips announced that the Justice Minister Delroy Chuck National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang and Attorney General Marlene Malahu Fort would be invited to participate in the meeting. However, Mr. Chuck has turned down the invitation. TVJ News understands that Mr. Chuck informed the opposition that he will not attend the event. Speaking with TVJ News, Mr. Chuck said the invitation was inappropriate. I did get their invitation and I uh, indicated that I would not be attending. I understand. Well, I was in Parliament, the Prime Minister did say he would send a delegation from the JLP to the conference. It seems to me, and I've said this, that it is inappropriate for the PNP to have a crime conference because it does come across as a political event. I think it would have been, been more appropriate for a third party, a non-political entity, such as the PSOJ, the churches, or any other civil society individually or collectively to be the sponsors of this crime summit. Dr. Phillips said the parliamentary opposition has no intention of scoring political points with hosting the national stakeholders meeting to discuss crime. 
he said nonpartisan discussions will be held with key stakeholders. A report on the outcome of the consultations will be presented to the government. But the Justice Minister has another issue with the PNP's stakeholders meeting. I think the PNP run the risk that it may well appear if it is very successful. They can take the credit and put forward all the proposals to fight crime. But if nothing constructive comes forward, it, it may well have been a big talk in Trump. Prince Moore, TVJ News. Meanwhile, opposition leader Dr. Peter Phillips has responded to the Justice Minister's decision not to attend the meeting. Speaking on the morning agenda on Power 106 earlier today, Dr. Phillips said he is taken aback by Mr. Chuck's response. However, Dr. Phillips says based on the comments of Prime Minister Andrew Holness in the House of Representatives on Tuesday, he does not appear to oppose the holding of the event. As the Prime Minister said clearly that they were not opposed and hoped to and that he would hope that... Uh, that representatives from his party would come. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we had had, and maybe Mr. Chuck doesn't know, we had had an agreement at the Fail Royal Talks that such a meeting would have been held under the auspices of the Vale Royal Talks. In the communique coming out of the Vale Royal Talks, there was a date set. It was the 16th of January. The Prime Minister cancelled at the last minute. There has been no date set despite repeated efforts. And we now take a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back. Continuing the news. A fatal shooting in Maypen Clarendon has left one man dead and a woman critically injured. This shooting adds to the rising criminal activities in the parish, which now has residents fleeing in fear. 40-year-old Brian McLennan was shot and killed at his home in Havana Heights, Maypen in Clarendon Wednesday morning. An unidentified woman who was inside the house at the time of the shooting is currently at hospital in critical condition. TVJ News spoke with Mr. McLennan's mother who told us she had only seen her son a few hours before. I see him yesterday. Yeah. He come from work. He come from work yesterday. I talk to him on the phone. I'm sending the son down here. Uh, and I cook for him every day. I cook him dinner every evening. I said, <laughs> she says her family is currently fleeing the parish as her son's death is not the first murder for the family in the space of two weeks. Everybody have run up and down. Everybody have run up and down because they killed one of the family out this last week and they shot one in the week before down the road. So I don't know what happened. Everybody have run up the yard. Miss White says she has no idea why her family is being targeted. However, they are taking the necessary steps to protect themselves from these unknown assailants. TVJ News understands that the gunmen forced their way into Mr. McLennan's house about 3 in the morning by kicking through the front door. They opened gunfire at both occupants, killing Mr. McLennan on the spot. The Clarendon police are still investigating the matter. Opposition leader Dr. Peter Phillips says he believes there should be a review of the policy of issuing credit cards to government ministers. He was speaking yesterday on Beyond the Headlines on the heels of revelation that former Education Minister Ruel Reed was given a credit card for which the government paid the bills. Dr. Phillips says a government led by him would re revisit the credit card policy. I personally prefer the question of having a reasonable per diem allowance and allowing that to be provided to the ministers to meet any out-of-pocket expenses. It is in a general case where there is a need for extraordinary expenditures, such as a minister having to entertain, in the case of a foreign minister or some other minister, then I think the best person to exercise those expenditures would be a permanent secretary or other public service official. Dr. Phillips says using credit cards for expenses, such as travel, makes it difficult to account for expenditures. Remember, in the case of the of Petra Jam, there was a lot of evidence, I think, presented to the parliamentary committee that 
a lot of private expenses, including private travel expenses, were charged to the government's account, in this case, Petrojam. And it always is the question of how do you monitor um, the expenditures? How do you distinguish what is private? In 2009, a circular from the Ministry of Finance allows for credit cards to be issued to ministers of government with a 2,500 U.S. dollar limit on international cards. The Housing Opportunity Production and Employment, HOPE program, is now in its third year of operation. The program, which is a government initiative providing various opportunities to thousands of young adults during the summer, has operated under the office of the Prime Minister for two years. Prime Minister Andrew Holness was speaking at a tour of the facility on Monday where he highlighted how critical programs like HOPE are for the economy and the principles they instill in the nation's youths. As our industries grow, they will need to employ more people. But if our people are not trained, then it increases the cost of employment to firms, and that will make business operations here uncompetitive. The principle is that we take the young people on, and they are learning. We pay them a stipend, so they are earning. Out of that, a very important principle, as I said before, is that you don't consume everything you earn today, because you have hope for the future, and therefore you can save, you can put something down, you can make the sacrifice. As the program branches out into its next phase, which aims to increase training and the number of young adults engaged yearly, accommodations will have to be made for these changes. We are now going to move into another phase of the program, and that is now to institutionalize the program. That means the program will probably move from the office of the Prime Minister under some other agency that could carry it more effectively. I see members of the JDF smiling. I don't see the heart people smiling. Now, the Prime Minister's tour was on Wednesday, where he also described the project as a success, noting in its contribution to establishing Jamaica's new lowest unemployment rate of just under 8%. The HOPE project has enrolled over 24,000 youths in the last two years. This year's cohort has over 6,000 participants. The Guardian Group Foundation on Tuesday disbursed approximately $7 million in scholarship and grants at its annual scholarship award ceremony at the AC Marriott Hotel in St. Andrew. A total of 19 students were honored. Among them were the island's top performing boy and girl in the primary exit profile, PEP. Under this PEP program, we are so happy because we are now the ones giving the scholarship to the top boy and top girl, separate from our usual top policyholder, boy and girl. We are now the ones giving the scholarship to the top in the island for top boy and top girl. And you know, again, we're just stepping it up another notch and, and supporting the education process even more. The top performing PEP students are Dominic Hazley from St. Peter and Paul Primary and Rachel Gammon from Hopefield Preparatory Schools, who were awarded $1 million each. The scholarship will last throughout their five-year high school tenure. My tenure. overall average mark was 361.5. I don't feel as though I could have gone any higher. I was even surprised to get that. I did her best in math and science because I got an equal score on those. I got a 361.8 average and I'm coming from St. Peter and Paul Preparatory School. I was extremely happy and it made me feel like I felt elated. We go down to news in sports. There's a new coaching relationship at the Harbour View Football Club as the stars of the East have called in an experienced duo ahead of the start of the new Red Stripe Premier League season. After avoiding relegation last season, the stars of the East have decided to draft in longtime coach Gregory Bartley and former Boy Stone star Howard Cephas. And Bartley, who is a former lecturer at GC Foster College, assumes the responsibility as technical director 
a position he held in the past. Looking back on the team, one of the main areas um, was that there was a lot of lack of leadership on the, on the team. There was also conditioning as a problem. I, I thought that technically they had some good players, but in terms of the physical and mental um, condition, they were a bit weak, and also the lack of leadership driving them on the, on the field of play. Cephas will operate as the team's head coach. For the past two seasons, Harbour View have tried to incorporate youth and experience, and Captain Nicholas Beckett feels the youngsters must rise to the occasion. There's a lot more work to be done. Uh, some of the youngsters, uh, they have a lot to learn. They have the talent, no question about that, but they just need to learn the game a bit more, and mentally, they need to be a bit tougher. Because Premier League is a, is a tough league, so they have to be ready mentally and physically. One senior player is Decoy Williams, who recently returned to Harperview, but has struggled in the past to remain fit. Yeah, I should be 100% um, fit when the season starts. I'm not as, as there as yet, but um, I, I can't say what percentage at the moment, but by the, the, the season should start, I should be 100%. Harborview finished ninth on the table at the end of last season, just five points above relegation. Renata Brown, 14. And that's the midday news. I'm Herman Green. Please join us at 7 for the primetime news package. On behalf of the news sports and production teams, good afternoon. <laughs>